Okay, good. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you for the organizers, the invitation, the dinner. <laughs> okay, so this is joined with uh, Marco, sorry, with Marco, who is giving a, a this, so to speak, second part of this talk later. Duvan, Enao, and Remy Rodiak. So I'll talk about uh, when, when the deformations in elasticity are regular and when they are singular, and what, I, um, what kind of singularities can they have. Okay, this is the standard setting in nonlinear elasticity. We have the deformation, we have the body, the reference configuration, the deformed configuration, the deformation, the energy of the deformation, but okay, in this, in this talk, the, the forces don't play a role, so you can ignore them. And uh, it is essential in this talk, uh, as, as we know uh, from many talks this week, to preserve the orientation and to be invertible. Uh, the usual setting in nonlinear elast elasticity to prove existence is well known. It is based on polyconvexity of the energy and some coercivity also of the energy. We need some coercivity for the gradient, for the cofactors, and for the determinant. And if for some P and Q, you have enough coercivity and you can prove existence. And the proof is uh, always the same. Basically, if you prove that the determinant of the gradient converts to the determinant of the gradient with linear one, you are done. And, and then the assumption is that the minimizing sequence converges in W1P weakly. <coughs> and it is known the optimals P and Q for which this happens. And uh, we call that the determinant is weakly continuous in this sense. Okay, so the point is that the P and Q for which the determinant is weakly continuous coincides with the P and Q for which uh, the deformation has nice properties. And this I will review which nice properties. So let's, uh, let's study first the regular case, when everything uh, works very well. The regular case corresponds to the exponent p greater than n, n is the dimension, or p equals n with the additional assumption of positive determinant. Okay, in that case, the deformations are continuous, they are weakly differentiable, the determinant is weakly continuous in the sense I explained earlier, and it satisfies Lucene's condition. So set of meso zero go to sets of meso zero. Matter is not created. Okay, we can lower the exponent to p greater than n minus one if we make the additional assumption that the cofactor is integrable enough. And traditionally, this has been proved in two steps. The easy, so to speak, easy case, this exponent, and the more difficult one, this exponent. And with this, you have the same regularity as before. Well, they are continuous except for a very small set. They are differentiable almost everywhere. The determinant is continuous and Lucene's condition is satisfied. Okay, so this is the, the regular case. And, and the exponents are optimal. The P is optimal and the Q is optimal. Well, in the critical case, uh, well, I'll talk later about the critical case. Okay, and a key ingredient in, in all this proof is the distributional determinant. And in all these good spaces, we have that the distributional determinant equals the pointwise determinant. That means, in other words, that the pointwise determinant is a divergence. So you can integrate by parts. And this is the, the, the key of many proofs. This is the definition of distributional determinant. So here, the derivatives are in the, in the test function. So you can integrate by parts. Now, <coughs> there is a generalization of the distributional determinant and the equality debt equals debt, which are the so-called divergence identities. So debt equals debt means this. This is the distributional divergence. Now, if we substitute uh, the deformation U 
with a composition G of U. If you substitute U by G of U, the analog of this equality becomes this one. The idea is that G is a test function, but in the deformed configuration. So the idea of this equality is that, well, if, if you develop this equality, if you develop what uh, distributional divergence means, so you multiply and integrate by parts, you get exactly this. So here in this formula, we have two test functions, the phi in the uh, the, f uh, the reference configuration, which is the typical one, and the new one is the G in the deformed configuration. And you really need to have votes. And this idea of having two test functions comes from, for example, from the theory of Cartesian coverings. And this is, this is very useful. Okay, and, and it was Muller who, 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 who said that this, is, this equality is important, who acknowledged the importance of that equality. Okay, and it turned out that uh, the divergence identities gives you, it, it is the, the, the divergence identity that gives you all the regularity. So in all the previous, uh, all the previous cases, the, the, with the P's and the Q's uh, greater than whatever, it, it wasn't important the P or the Q. What, is, was, uh, what, what it was essential were the divergence identities. So it is the divergence identities that ultimately imply all the good properties, continuity, differentiability, continuity of the determinant, and Lucene's condition. Okay, this is not the main point of the talk, but okay, since in this week we have talked about local invertibility and global invertibility, okay, just to say that in, in again, the divergence identities imply local invertibility. So this is a sort of inverse function theorem for almost every point. There is a ball around which U is injective. And uh, under some other assumptions that we have learned this week, uh, they are global invertible. And there are several possibilities. One is that uh, it coincides with uh, an injective function on the boundary the famous Sierra conditions, or the, that it is the limit of injective maps, but only on the boundary, not in the interior. Uh, okay, so um, again, this you can do this in this setting. Okay, so this is a regular case, very good. Now, we load the exponent of the Qs to allow for some singularities, and the, the most important singularity is the cavitation one. So this is the, this, these are the pictures of cavitation. So in, a, in, a, in cavitation, you open a hole, and this is typical in rubber, and this is because of the incompressibility. So if you, if you do a, a triaxial extension and the material is almost incompressible, the only possibility is to open a hole. Okay, the easiest cavitation is the radial one. So if it has this form, R is a radial function and um, it is positive at the origin. So it transforms the circle to an annulus and it opens a hole of radius uh, R of, of zero. Since this is explicit, you can do the calculations and you can see that it is Sobolev W1P for all P less than N and the cofactor is in LQ for all Q less than N over N minus one. So it is just the opposite case of the, of the exponents that appear in the, in the regular case. So these exponents are not coincidental. <coughs> okay, condition inf plays an important role. Uh, luckily, Standa explained it, so I can go quick. So condition inf means that inside goes inside and outside goes outside. And inside and outside is distinguished by the uh, degree. Ins outside would mean degree zero, and inside would mean degree different from zero, which in practice it will be one but we will see. 
Okay, in general, well, uh, by the Quaria formula, um, U is W1P on the boundary of almost every ball, so the, the degree is defined, and inf means that inside the ball, you, you go inside the ball, and outside the ball, you go outside the ball. So almost every sphere is impenetrable. You cannot trespass the spheres. Okay, the good thing, well, there are many good things about the degree. One of them is that uh, it detects the cavities. So uh, the topological image of a point is the set of points in the image where the degree is different from zero. Is what we understand by inside a closed curve. If we let the um, radius to go to zero, we get the topological image of a point. If it is a point of continuity, we get just the image of u x zero, but if it is a point of cavity, we get the hole created by the cavity because the hole is uh, in the in the inner component of of the surface created by the, the cavity. The hole is inside, so the degree is different from zero. So by definition, we can define a cavity point, those points for which the topological image has positive volume. Okay, and this is the set of all cavity points. This is called the C of U. Well, how many of them are there? Well, there are, no, this is later. Okay. Now we go back to the divergence identities, and it is easy to see that when, when there is a cavity, the distributional determinant is not the point-wise determinant, which is good, because that means that the distributional determinant detects the cavities. So the divergence identities, which is a generalization, cannot hold. So the idea is how to quantify that the divergence identities don't hold. These are the divergence identities, so how to quantify whether this is uh, different from zero. So the idea again uh, uh, comes from the theory of Cartesian currents, taking test function of both variables, the x in the reference, the y in the deform, and if f is, the, is this product, f if phi is scalar, g is vectorial, then the divergence identities with this f have this form. And now the quantification of the failure of this formula is the supremum when f is less than one of this quantity. Uh, you can think this, this is not so different from the George's definition of perimeter of a set. So you take the supremums of something that typically is a divergence. But in the case of cavities, this is not a divergence anymore. So it will detect how uh, this fails from being a divergence. And this, this is the perimeter of something. We will see what. Okay, now the, the distributional determinant detects the cavities. So for some, well, with some uh, assumptions, the most important one, that the surface energy is finite, then the distributional determinant equals the point-wise determinant plus the cavities. And the cavities are deltas uh, located at the cavity points times, um, times some numbers. In principle, some real numbers. And if condition inf is satisfied and a positive determinant, then these numbers are positive and they are the volume of the cavity created. So we have a description of the cavities with a distributional determinant. Okay, so, so very good. 
Now, there is a pathology that we called invisible created surface, and uh, it was this example of Muller and Spector. And this example tells us that when cavities are created, you have to be careful about what you mean by interpenetration of matter, because you can interpenetrate even though you are injective, even though the determinant is positive. So in this example, Muller and Spector constructed nine cavities here and nine cavities there. Okay, so far so good. We know how to do cavities. Now, we bend this bar and we interlace the cavities in such a way that matter here goes to vacuum here and vacuum here goes to matter here. So this is the funny interlacing. It is a very, mm, very tuned interlacing. Since matter goes to vacuum and vacuum goes to matter, the deformation is injective. But there must be some interpenetration. So if you only look at the deformed configuration, you, you cannot distinguish the, gray, the uh, light gray uh, with the dark gray. So you will see everything matter. And this is called the invisible surface. It is a surface that has been created, but it is, uh, it is uh, juxtaposed uh, with another piece of created surface. And the visible one is the normal one. There is matter at one side and vacuum at the other side. In the invisible one, there is matter at one side, matter in the other side, but the, the matter comes from two different points. And the way to distinguish the invisible surface is via the discontinuity points of the inverse. Because if you approach from one side, you get here, and you approach from the other side, you get there. The inverse has a jump. And the visible surface is the typical one. Matter at one side, uh, vacuum at the other. That's why it is density one half in the image. Clearly, the invisible surface is pathological. So we, w we would like to avoid invisible surface. Okay, and then this is a, a geometric interpretation of the, of the of the surface energy, the surface energy that it was defined like a the Georgi perimeter turned out to be the area of the visible surface time uh, plus twice the area of the invisible. And it is twice the invisible because when you have invisible surface, it, be, it is because two surfaces have been put together. So you really need this two. And moreover, if this tends to be finite and inf conditions and positive determinant, then the surface is the sum of the surface created by the cavities. So remember, the topological image of a point is the volume of the cavities. So the perimeter is the surface of the cavity. You sum more of them and you get uh, our surface energy. And you don't have pathological behavior, you don't have invisible surface, and the visible surface is the union of the boundaries of the cavities. So it is condition inf that prevents the invisible surface to appear. And this theorem says essentially that the only process of creation of surface is the cavities. So, we are in the singular case, but not so singular. We have very controlled which kind, which kind of, of singularities we can have. Uh, or if we want to do an existing theory, well, uh, well, it is available in, in these exponents, p greater than n minus one, or if we go to p equals n minus one, we need equi-integrability of the cofactor, so q greater than one. Could be any, any, any equi-integrability will do. I mean, um, in the Orlitz space, 
T, L1 of T, log T, or whatever, it will, will work as well. And now, uh, a really pathological case, which is the harmonic dipoles. Let's see. So we load exponent. Um, and we start with an example of Conti and the Lelis. And they constructed this funny <laughs> counter example. Dimension three. They constructed a sequence of homeomorphisms, Bilipsis, without surface energy. So the divergence identity holds. Surface energy equals zero is equivalent to divergence identities. In particular, that equals that. They converge weakly in W12, which is the critical case. The determinant converges to the determinant. Um, the limit is injective. The limit is positive determinant, but not really orientation preserving, despite uh, that the determinant is positive. In the limit, the determinant is not the pointwise determinant. It has some cavities, which could be OK, but here there is a minus sign. So there is a positive cavity and a negative cavity. Negative cavity is a cavity that reverses the orientation. In particular, the surface energy is positive. And in the limit, uh, they don't satisfy inf. And we learned last Tuesday that recently an uh, standard and, and late Jan Mali uh, constructed um, well, another example of this. It is good to have two examples. <laughs> yeah. Good. What happens here? What happens is the exponent p equals n minus 1, so in dimension 3, p equals 2, and q equals 1. The, the, the cofactors are not equintegrable. So, so let's study this example and let's let's see how general this example. The the summary will be that this this behavior is generic. This pathology is generic in these exponents. Okay. So in the previous classes of math, in the super regular case uh, and in the cavitation case, uh, we 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 could do uh, a, an existence theory. Eh? So uh, the, these classes were close and the weak convergence. In particular, we can put as a restriction the divergence identities, and they pass to the limit. We can put a restriction in a bound of the surface energy, and it passes to the limit. We can put as a restriction condition inf, and it passes to the limit. Here, in, in the critical exponent n minus 1 for p and q equals 1, none of these restrictions are closed. And this is what happens in the example of, of Conti de Lillis. So what we are trying to do, what we have done partially, is to describe the weak cluster of, of, this, um, of these maps. First, uh, let's simplify the situation. The Conti de Lillis example is axisymmetric, and also the example of Standa, Anna, and, and Jan was axisymmetric. So, okay, let's simplify the situation and let's work in the axisymmetric case. So, let's work in the axisymmetric case. We put a very nice boundary condition, a diffeomorphism. Okay. So, we work in in this class of functions. R is for regular, S is for symmetric, well, axisymmetric. And regular means that the divergence identities hold. This is pretty much regular, as, as, as we saw earlier. Some boundary data, positive uh, determinant, injective, axisymmetric, okay. And we want to describe as much as possible the weak closer of this under, under, well, in the weak closer in W12. So we are in dimension three, and P equals N minus one, which is two. And then we have this, well, preliminary result. A, a bar is weak closer. So in the weak closer, U is injective. Injectivity is 
um, is preserved in the limit. This is good, but remember that we might have interpenetration even though it is injective. Now, the image also behaves well. The image equals the image of the boundary data, which is okay. And we may think that this says that there is no cavitation. No, uh, <laughs> because if we fill if we fill all the deformed configuration, it means that there are no holes. Yes, there are very strange holes that I'll describe later. The determinant is positive, that's no problem. And the inverse is bounded variation. This is good, but we would like that the inverse uh, is, has no cantor part in the derivative, is SVV. Inverse Sobolev, uh, forget about that. Inverse Sobolev would mean uh, there are no jumps of the inverse and the jumps are the invisible surface and the invisible surface indicates failure of inf. No, so you, you cannot hope for inverse uh, Sobolev, but you might hope for SVV. Okay, we need one assumption more, forget SVV for the inverse which is, if we put this assumption that the surface energy is finite, then we get, well, we get a lot of things that I'll explain one by one, but we get uh, SVV, only jumps in the, in the inverse, no cantor part in the inverse. And we get many other things that I will explain one by one and with a picture. Okay, uh, this is the Conti de Lelis example. It is axisymmetric, so we'll, uh, we, it is enough to do a, a 2D uh, picture. I'm not going to explain how this horrible thing can be the limit of homeomorphisms, but in any case, we learn from, from standard stock that <laughs> many horrible things can be the limit of homeomorphisms. Um, and, and in fact, Marco will explain how this can be the limit of homeomorphisms. Okay, what happens here is, uh, this is the deformed, this, sorry, this is the reference, this is the deformed. Uh, in P, we create a hole, a typical hole. We know how to, how to create holes. And this is the hole created by P. And then E is stretched to this uh, moon-like shape. Okay, E is, okay, fine enough. This doesn't, this is a transition layer, so to speak. And what happens in O is that all the material from A goes through O like a, half tennis ball, when you avert a half tennis ball, but all the material escapes from O and, and ends up here. But in this aversion of the tennis ball, there is, uh, there, is um, uh, there is an orientation reversing. So A goes to this A, but with reversing the orientation, despite the, the, the determinant is positive. Okay, so this is more or less the example of Conti and the Lelis. As you can see, two cavities, one, one positive and one negative. Okay, the inverse is SVV, the inverse, here it is very good, here it is very good, here it is very good, and the only this singularity of the inverse is in this curve gamma, which, what, which is, um, this is the whole created by P, but it is filled by the hole created by O. That's, that's why there are two holes, even though we fill the whole, um, the whole boundary values or the whole uh, reference configuration. So this is typical. Anyway, the, the singular, the, the inverse has only jumps. So if we, you come from here and approach gamma, you get to P and you come, if you come from inside and approach gamma, you go to O. So the inverse has jumps. 
Now, next item. The, the determinant equals, the distributional determinant equals the determinant plus some deltas. Very good. But now the coefficient can be positive or negative. If it is positive, it is the volume of the cavity. If it is negative, it is the absolute value still is the volume of the cavity, but indicates an orientation reversal. So in this example, we have positive cavitation in P, enclosing a volume, a, a ball, well, almost a ball of, yes, uh, it's a ball, a ball of uh, volume P halves in this example, and negative in O, enclosing a volume of the same P half, because it is the same volume, but one reverses the orientation. Next item. Um, well, uh, in the jumps of the inverse, the, when you approach from one side and you approach from the other side, in the limit, you get a cavity. So that means that the jumps of the inverse only come from the cavities. So they are the boundary of the volume enclosed by the cavities. And in this example, if you approach from here, you go to P. If you approach from outside, if you approach from inside, you go to the point zero. There is no visible surface, so there is no visible cavities. But there is invisible surface, which are the jumps of the inverse. So this is the pathology, whenever you have invisible surface. And uh, this is, OK, here there is no visible surface. And the invisible surface is just the volume of the cavities. Of the, the two cavities have the same, enclose the same volume. And now here, uh, what says is that we have a dipole structure so that the cavities come from pairs. So if, if we try to compute the total variation of the singular part of the inverse, which is only the jump part because it is SVV, it is the discontinuity points, the area of these discontinuity points, times the distance between the two cavities that produce these, conti these continuity points. So what we are saying here is that there is a dipole structure. Well, here is the plus and the minus, but don't worry about that. The important thing in this example is that the, the, um, <coughs> the norm of the derivative of the inverse, the singular part, is the area of the jumps of the inverse times the distance between the two uh, dipoles that we call dipoles. And finally, the degree is still, a variation of the degree can still detect the invisible cavities. So this is the topological image. We subtract the normal image, and in the limit we get whether there is cavity or not. So this uh, delta x indicates if x is a cavity point, and in that case, the volume enclosed by the cavity point and the orientation of the cavity. So this is zero except for the cavity points. And in this example, in P, this is the characteristic function of region A with positive sign. In O, it is the characteristic function of region A with negative sign, and there is a cancellation. So the sum of all cavities are zero. That means that if you create a cavity, you have to fill it from somewhere else. And so again, this tells us that it has a dipole structure. If there is a positive cavity, there must be a negative cavity. And this is what, what happens here, positive and negative. And well, this is related to the bubbling of harmonic maps. We have a dipole phenomenon, so it is related to some classic um, behavior of harmonic maps in the sphere. 
And basically what this theorem says is that the, the example of continentalities is generic. So we have point singularities, we have interpenetration, orientation reversal, cavities are filled, we have bubbling and we have dipoles. And then we quickly, we have checked the example of of Standa and Anna, and, and luckily it, it, they satisfy, it satisfies our theorem. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> anyway, and well, since we talk uh, about the, the results, okay, what, what they, they told us many things on last Tuesday, but what they told, which is very related to this, is that there are two ways of avoiding pathological behavior. One way of avoiding the pathological behavior is that the determinant goes quick enough to infinity. Sorry, the energy goes quick enough to infinity when the determinant goes to zero. In this way, you, uh, inf is preserved. And the other way is that the cofactors are equi-integrable. Okay, they, they did more, but this is the things that are more related. Okay, so in general, uh, regularity. So we have regularity in this range of exponents, p greater than n, or p greater than n minus 1 and q greater than this, or the, the, the divergence identities hold. We have the region of cavity when q is greater than 1, and finally when in the supercritical case, p equals n minus 1 and q equals 1, we can have dipoles as, as, we, as we saw. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you.